Hi, I'm Greg Yellen with Reynolds & Reynolds, and this is Connected. I'm excited about this episode today. I get to have a conversation with Cheryl Thompson. Cheryl is the CEO and founder of the Center for Automotive Diversity, Inclusion, and Advancement, or CADIA. Um, Cheryl's got a great background in automotive. She spent uh, 30 plus years at Ford. Um, so Cheryl, thanks so much for, uh, for joining. Thanks for having me, Greg. Yep, absolutely. All right. So Cheryl, want to get into certainly Cadia and uh, what you're doing today and some of your background. But before we get there, um, I was doing a little uh, little research uh, just on you before before jumping on. I saw that uh, you got your undergrad at Siena Heights in Adrian, Michigan. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So I grew up uh, kind of right in the northwest corner of Ohio, and we'd go to Detroit for Tigers games and stuff like that. So I drive through Adrian sometimes. Um, and I got to ask, there was a, a little pizza place. I don't know if it was there maybe, you know, back then, but it was a little pizza place called Vietti's Pizza. And it was uh, like, it's, I swear it was in somebody's garage almost. Um, so I don't know if, if that rings a bell at all, but I just, I saw um, Sienna Heights and I was like, you know what? I know where that is. I wasn't sure if, uh, if you had any memories from then too. Yeah, Greg, you know, I got my undergrad while I was working. So it was mm. at a satellite location in Southfield, Michigan. So I never got to spend time in Adrian. Um, but yeah, you know, my career path is a little non-traditional. So I ended up having credits from five different colleges and universities. And Siena Heights was the one that was able to let me transfer all of those and apply practical work experience. So I loved my time with Siena, but didn't get to spend time in Adrian. <laughs> oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's very interesting though, that, uh, kind of, you know, Southern Michigan area, even, you know, you're in obviously Southeast Michigan, but, but spreading yes. across the state, you know, there's some great, um, uh, great areas up there. Um, yes. but so yeah, if you don't mind, talk a little bit then about that background, you said maybe a non-traditional background as you've yes. kind of grown in, in automotive. Um, so talk a little bit about that if you don't mind. Sure. Well, it's so interesting. Most people in the industry, have a story about how they landed in automotive. We never intentionally set out <laughs> to be in automotive. And mine is a similar story. When I was in high school, I had plans to do something with computers, right? It was the 80s and computers were just coming into play. And I really thought I would be a systems analyst, something like that. And graduated early from high school. I was so excited to get started. And I ended up getting pregnant right away. And um, I was waitressing at the time. And so my plans to go to college got set to the side. And my dad, who was an engineer at Ford Motor Company, said, listen, if you're going to waitress, why not see if you could get a job at Ford Motor Company? He said, maybe they'll pay for your benefits, your schooling, you know, all that good stuff. So my mom actually drove me to the World Headquarters building in Dearborn, Michigan, and I went and applied and they hired me on the spot. Like they handed wow. me an apron and said, can you start right now? And so my first job was washing dishes in the basement of Ford World Headquarters. And wow. if you can imagine, if you remember that, uh, I love Lucy episode, but the chocolates in the factory and she, yeah. they're, they're coming down the conveyor belt. That that was <laughs> like the trays are coming down the, the belt and I'm trying to get all the dishes washed. And then I got to work in the executive dining room, the penthouse. So I got to wait on all of the executives. And I've got to see a good example of leadership. What is good leadership and what is not good leadership by the way people treated me? Um, you know, if somebody was dismissive, you know, or, you know, you could kind of tell if they were trying to climb to the top by stepping over someone else or if they really cared about people genuinely. I got to wait on Jesse Jackson because often they would host parties there. And he was I re I'll never forget it. Just so kind, looked at me in the eye, asked me what my name was. So anyways, great experience. And then they were trying to recruit women and minorities into the skilled trades. And I was thinking electrician, pipe fitter. I know what that is. And I could work on the outside if I ever got laid off because layoffs were very common in those days. And they were trying to put people into tool and die. And I had no idea what tool and die was. Um, so for those who don't know what tool and die is, it is making the dies that go into these big presses that stamp out car parts through forming or trimming. Um, and I, I thought I was going to make tools and dye them, Greg. I had no idea what that was. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, spent a, four years doing an apprenticeship, spent a couple of years um, as a journeyman, journeywoman. And I had a superintendent who came alongside me 
and said, listen, Cheryl, you don't want to be wrenching on tools your entire career. Have you ever thought about going into engineering? So when I think back to that interaction, that was an example of not only mentorship, but sponsorship. Um, my, my, his name was Smitty. My superintendent's name was Smitty. And, you know, he introduced me to the idea I could be an engineer and he introduced me to his network. So he kind of put his social capital out on the line for me. So my career, you know, non-traditional, kept going to school, got my bachelor, got my MBA while working at Ford. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the career path. That's great. That's great. So you mentioned something in there. Yes. Um, that, that stood out to me, you know, you said most of us never intentionally set out to be in automotive. Um, and honestly, I think that's a good segue to talk about, you know, why, right? Why is that? Why, um, for, it's such a great industry, right? And it's such a broad industry and it's such a, honestly, a diverse industry and in what you can do inside of it. Um, there's so many opportunities and it's so large, um, why do you think it is that it's not one of the, you know, call it top three when, when kids are in high school and their counselors are talking to them or, you know, even going into college and they're looking at degrees, like, why isn't it a field that people get super, super excited about? I, Cause I mean, I love it, right? I've been in, personally, I've been in automotive since I was 10 years old. It was auto parts, but you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's still the, yeah. the field. And, um, I don't know. I think it's a great, great industry, probably one of, if not the best in our country. And it is baffling to me why why it's not more of a destination. Yes, yes. Well, a couple of things. I think on the manufacturing side, we still think about manufacturing as dark, dingy and dangerous. And a lot of parents, you know, have that thought in mind. And so they have a big influence on where their kids, you know, what their kids study and, and what they pursue. So I think that's one. Um, I think the second thing on the retail side is people think of sales, like I don't want to be a, a car salesman, maybe. But I think that once people get in, they realize just as you said, there's endless opportunities. And right now, if you think about the industry, we've got more change going on now than we've had over the last hundred years, you know, with with advanced mobility and where we're going with electrification. I know that the adoption of electrification is a little slow, but it's going to happen. (laughs) You know, we we went from horses to steam to combustion engines. It's just a, a natural progression once we get all of these challenges has worked out. Um, but I just think it's um, uh, it, it's uh, myths and stereotypes that people believe. And, you know, it's a great way to make money there. It's very lucrative, yeah. both on the retail side and on the manufacturing side. You're right. You're right. Yeah, we just I don't know. I take I think it takes all of us to to spread that word and, and just make sure that everybody is, if nothing else, aware of how great of an industry that we're we're part yeah. of and we have. Yeah. And the people um, are amazing, right? The camaraderie. Oh, it's just incredible. <laughs> it really is. really is. So Cheryl, tell me a little bit about um, your, I'll call it a switch, right? So you were 30, 31 years, something along those yeah. lines at Ford. Um, so a great career at Ford where you had a lot of different roles and opportunities. Um, but then you went and started Cadia. Yes. Um, so, so why, what was that decision like? What was that transition like? Um, you know, I guess talk about that journey a little bit, cause I could only imagine that's, that's quite the leap. It was definitely quite the leap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always had an interest to do something different. I ended up in automotive accidentally and I was always looking at other opportunities. So I got certified as a coach and, you know, uh, a career coach and just was looking at different things. And, you know, being the only woman in the room, many rooms on the plant floor, um, having that experience, I wanted to help other women. And that's where it started. And before I retired, I was leading um, powertrain prototype. And one of the gentlemen that worked for me was a black gentleman. And he was sharing with me that he felt in meetings he was overlooked at times, uh, his competence questioned, not listened to. And I looked at him and I, it was a big aha. And I said, boy, I thought that only happened to women. And he said, nope. <laughs> and, and that just made me start thinking about how do we help people who are underrepresented advance? And so that was the, the pull. And it was almost like this invisible force pulling me out. Like before I knew it, I was on the phone putting in my retirement paperwork. 
Hmm. And the transition, you know, it was tricky. Um, I grew up with Ford. Uh, They were like a parent to me, you know, coming in at age 19 and, you know, having them support me through my degree programs and all of the different opportunities that I got. And now I'm an entrepreneur and I am trying to figure out how to manage my schedule, how to put myself out there. It was a big, big uh, shift for me. (laughs) Right. So um, quite interesting. And when we first got started and I'm trying to figure out what to name the organization, I love the acronym because, you know, it's it it sounds nice. Cadia. It sounds like a name. Sure. And when I researched Cadia, Googled it, it's an underground gold mine in Australia. And I Hmm. thought, oh, my goodness, like this, this is perfect because there's a gold mine for employers if they can diversify their workforce. And there's a gold mine for employees who are going to enter the automotive industry. Um, so that's a little bit about how we got started. Um, we had our first event in October of 2018, and our annual event is called Rev Up 2030. Our goal is to double the amount of diverse leaders by by t- the year 2030. And um, we've just kept growing. We just did year seven last year of our annual Rev Up event. Um, So we are an organization that is really big in creating community with those who are trying to advance diversity, equity and inclusion in their workplace. So we do things like uh, roundtables to share best practices, lessons learned, a place where people can go for questions and and really um, uh, being able to provide some benchmarks. That's great. That's great. So you mentioned um, doubling leaders uh, by 2030. Um, Mm -hmm. How's that going? So you're seven years in, you said you got, what is it, six years to go, right? So how's how's progress? How's it going? You know, it is, it's coming along. Um, We just did a study recently to be able to have a baseline. There's not, there had not been um, a lot of data out there in the past. Um, so when I did look for data, there was some um, automotive data for women uh, put out by Catalyst, uh, probably in the year 2019. Very limited data set, but at the time for women in executive roles, it was 8%. So we conducted our own study for a couple of different reasons. Number one, we wanted that baseline. Where do we stand for women, uh, ethnic and racial minorities, Um, across job job categories and across leadership levels. And uh, what we found when we looked at women is we are making some progress. Um, If I look at the overall workforce, women are 47%. When we look at automotive uh, transportation, it's 24%. That's not great. But the good news is when we look at the executive roles, like two down from CEO, it's 22%. So that is carrying through. Usually when you look at a leadership pipeline, it almost looks like a pyramid. You have less and less diversity as you get to the top. For women, that representation is carrying through. Mm -hmm. So when I look at the 8% back in 2019 to this 22% from our study data, it's not apples to apples, but it is generally telling me we're moving in a good direction. When I go to conferences, you know, um, Automotive News has something called Leading Women. There's a there's a buzz about seeing women represented in these senior and executive roles. Um, So we're seeing it Um, when we look at racial and ethnic minorities. We're not doing as good. Um, So I think we need to apply some of the lessons learned that we used for advancing women for ethnic and racial minorities. Um, There's good representation at the entry level roles, but when we look at follow that all the way through uh, to people, leaders and executive senior level roles, uh, there's there's a quite a big gap there. Yeah. So there's there's a couple things I want to double click on and and dig Mm -hmm. into there. But before we get there, I do want to just take a quick step back and level set um, because I I really am interested in this topic. Um, But. I want to get your perspective on, you know, what what business problem are we solving by by attacking, you know, diversity, equity and inclusion? So there's there's I would say I think clearly um, that's just my opinion. um, There's a, you know, a social responsibility. You could call it a social problem, but a social responsibility. Um, But is there a business problem we're solving? And and are those two things mutually exclusive? I don't don't know. What's your perspective? 
Yeah. Well, I think the the problem we're trying to solve, uh, there's a few things. You know, number one, we want better representation because our workplaces should look like the communities we're serving. You know, so if you think about the, the retail side of things and you go into a dealership, is there someone that I can identify with, that I feel comfortable with, that I trust, who I'm going to buy my car from or who's going to service my car? So number one is that representation. And I think that representation is important to have, um, you know, that diversity all the way through that pipeline. You know, like I was saying before, typically it tends to look like that pyramid where you see less and less representation as you get to the top. You know, we need to see people who we can identify with to know it's possible. You know, for me, not seeing any women in leadership for so many years held me back. I didn't put myself out there and take risks and get that exposure and visibility that's necessary for advancement. So representation is one. Um, the second is creating inclusive environments where everyone can thrive and succeed. And you know that allows an environment where you've got a good culture. So if you walk into a dealership, you can feel the energy, right? Is there a good culture or maybe not so good? You know, just the, the feeling. Um, so I think creating those environments um, and cultures that everyone feels, you know, like they can bring their best selves to work and like they have an opportunity to advance. And then, you know, the third thing is, is making sure we have policies guidelines, processes in place that prevent mistreatment, discrimination, or bias. Um, and when we do all of that, I think the payoff is, you know, more innovation and creativity, um, more discretionary effort. You know, if I feel included, valued, respected, I'm going to give you my all. You know, I'll run through a brick wall for someone that I respect and that I feel is respecting me back. So think about the, that discretionary effort, multiply that by however many employees or associates you have and, and think about what that could do for your business. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's, that's a great perspective. Um, so digging into it a little bit, I think there's, there's two things I want to touch on. The first one is around, uh, you, you were mentioning, you know, with women in the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. um, the total U S workforce is around 50%, 47, I think you said, yes. um, in an automotive it's, it's 24. So, mm -hmm. you know, a much less significant portion of the workforce in automotive. Um, so to me that, that points toward recruiting, right? How do we get more people, um, that are, that are women into the automotive industry? How do we appeal to women more effectively? And, um, you know, obviously we all want, I think anyway, we all want the best candidates for any given role, right? And, yes. And in my opinion, you know, what someone looks like shouldn't have a, an impact on if they are the best candidate, right? But you want the opportunity to hire the best candidate. You want to see the best people so that you have that pool to choose from. Um, so how do we broaden the pool of candidates to include um, certainly women, but just people of any um you know, background, whether it's it's um, gender or race or ethnicity or socioeconomic or any background, right? How do we how do we expand our pool where we have the opportunity to make the best decision for our business, right? And and maybe we end up hiring a woman, maybe we end up hiring a man. You don't know, but you don't have the opportunity if you don't have the people there to choose from, right? right. So when we're recruiting, how do we pull more people in to have a bigger pool? What what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so many things. Um, you know, a lot of companies operate with a referral system. And, and that can be great if you already have a diversified workforce. But if you have a very homogeneous workforce, you're going to get more of the same. So really thinking about a referral program that you have. Um, you know, thinking about companies that have employee resource groups, you leverage those employee resource groups to, you know, spread the word and connect with those communities that maybe have been overlooked in the past. Um, another thing is look at your colleges and your universities that you're recruiting from. I know, you know, back in the day when I was at Ford, we were recruiting from the same top 10 schools time and time again. And when, if you remember back in 2007 through nine, when we had that big downturn, we had all kinds of layoffs. Then back in 2011, when we were trying to replenish our workforce and, and hire engineers, those top 10 schools weren't working anymore because 
all of the talent had either left the state or left the industry because it is quite cyclical. And we had to be very creative and start looking at other universities and colleges. So that was huge, you know, really expanding your 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 base of colleges and universities, being a little creative. We looked at veterans. Um, so we hooked up with a lot of veteran organizations. And then, um, you know, when I talked to college um, uh, campus recruiting offices um, uh, or career centers, excuse me, they talk about the need to build relationships. So oftentimes employers will come on campus when there's a career fair. Um, and what the campus offices are saying is we need to see you on campus more than just when there's a career fair. We need you building relationships with the career office, with the students by doing things like um, hosting mock interviews or giving feedback on students' resumes. So when you are hiring, you've got that relationship. You can call up the career center and say, hey, here's what we have open. So that's another thing. Um, another is to um, connect with minority serving organizations. Um, you know, there's uh, Automotive Women's Alliance Foundation. There's one in the South as well. Um, there is uh, NSBE, which is National Society of Black Engineers. There's SWE, Society of Women Engineers. You know, thinking about those professional organizations that serve minority communities, having relationships with them, sponsoring some of their events, perhaps. Um, so it takes a lot of extra work. Um, and I think hiring managers need to get a little bit more involved. We can't leave it all to HR and recruiters. Um, we need to, need to see their presence out on LinkedIn, right? That's another great thing. Uh, talking about how great your company is to work and what opportunities are out there um, and engaging with people um, through LinkedIn. Um, yeah. It's endless, <laughs> yeah, no, but, it's, but it takes work. It takes work. It does. It does. So um, maybe too, you can you can add to all of that through with with a retail lens. So I think about you know a dealership, an auto retailer, mm -hmm. um, and the traditional model I would say is you know we hire people at a fairly entry level role, whether that's a salesperson, whether that's a technician, potentially an advisor, um, and as they learn and grow and, and produce, um, you know they they get additional opportunities, right? Maybe they if they're in sales, maybe they move into a sales management role. Maybe they move into a finance manager role. Maybe, you know, and then yeah. they can continue to grow. Um, same thing in, in fixed ops, right? Maybe I start as a technician. Um, I do that for quite a while. I grow. And, and a lot of technicians, quite honestly, they do so well. Um, they're they're happy right there where they're at. But some, you know, maybe then they say, okay, now I want to sell stuff. So I'm going to go and be an advisor. And then maybe they're a service manager. And so there's this natural progression, right? And we see it a lot. Um, so when I think about hiring for those entry level roles, right? Um, I think technicians is, is one that we can probably leave out for a second. I think there's a lot more opportunities in trade schools and high schools to, to get involved there. Um, but when we think about, uh, salespeople or we think about service advisors, those kind of really public facing roles that make or break the success of your dealership ultimately, right? Either you're going to sell a car, or you're going to sell a service or you're not. It's <laughs> and that, that yeah. person that person, that individual is really the linchpin that's going to do it. So when you think about, especially those, those salespeople, whether we're talking about in the front end of the store or the back end, um, do you have any ideas on how to recruit more broadly for those roles? Um, you know, I think you do have some experience if I, if I read correctly with AutoNation and Lithia and some large retailers. Mm -hmm. Um, but in, you know, any other ideas on how we can expand our recruiting pool, uh, for those more, I'll call them sales oriented roles. Yeah. Um, so first, I want to point out in our study data, we did also look at retail and retail is doing better in terms of ethnic and racial minorities and in the workforce. Um, they're not doing as great as advancing them through the pipeline. So there, there is a bigger gap there. Um, so I just I did want to point that out. But I think looking at other industries, because. If you can do sales in, let's say, pharmaceutical or you know any other industry, you can do sales in automotive. And sometimes we're a little narrow in thinking the person has to have automotive experience. So just being a little bit creative. Um, I'll never forget, I was talking to a gentleman that runs a dealership, and he will be recruiting even when he's out to breakfast or lunch. You know, think about a waitress. 
Um, yeah. You know, and he'll talk to them and he'll say, do you realize that you could be a service advisor? You know, the skills of customer service, you know, you know, so if he sees someone that he just think is, thinks is a standout, he's always recruiting, <laughs> right? And telling them about this great industry and the opportunities. Um, and yes, they are going to enter in those um, beginning positions. But once they get in there, laying out the opportunities training plans, career paths are are so important. And again, having diversity throughout your functional areas and through the different leadership levels is so important so that people can see what's possible. You know, I always talk about you need bait. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> you know, having some women in high visibility positions, you know, having um, people with a diverse background in those positions is really important. So being creative, looking outside of the industry, because so many of those skills are transferable. Also getting into the, the schools, you know, we, we talked about the um, technician positions. Uh, boy, do we have some work to do on gender there. You know, I, sure. I don't know where it's at now, but last time I looked, it was only 2% of technicians were female. Um, and it, it's just such a great field to get into. And there's so much support once you get in there. Um, there's a lot of great organizations. You know, I can think about um, Women of Color Automotive Network, WOCAN. Yeah. I've attended some of their events as um, as an ally, and there was a young woman um, who wanted to get into being a technician, and she was looking for help. Those women scooped her up and supported her, and you know she's working as a technician now. Um, so yeah, being creative and looking outside of automotive, who can we pull in? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I love that. I actually hadn't thought about it in a long time, but I used to. Um, so. I, Going back quite a few years, um, I had a sales team that that I had the opportunity to lead, and you know you're always recruiting when you when you yeah. have a sales team that you're you're a part of, and um, our sales leaders across kind of our our department, we would um, all make sure that we had you know cards with us wherever we were on the weekend, whatever, because you know if you're in any retail establishment, you go to Target. Right. And somebody goes a little out of their way to help you out. They have great interpersonal skills um, and they can communicate effectively. Uh, you know, that's somebody that you say, you know what, there's there might be an opportunity here. Give me a call and or shoot me your resume and, and let's see if, if there's an opportunity. So that's a really good point. I hadn't thought about in a long time is just keeping your eyes open in any interaction that you have in any sort of retail experience. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, but I do want to dig in. So you started going down the path of promoting and developing folks as well, right? Especially mm -hmm. in the different uh, racial and, and ethnic backgrounds. You, you said that the data that you, you guys had from your survey showed that um, that's where there's probably the biggest opportunity for us is, is in that promotion area. Um, so on that, on that, I think one of the the mental models that I don't think is wrong, but I think can can be a little bit of a hurdle for us at times, is this idea that because I do think that meritocracy is the way to go whenever you're looking at promoting yeah. someone, right? I mean, mm -hmm. people who perform well and they have the skill sets needed to move into the next role should be the people that you move into those roles. Yes. Um, and and they should earn it, right? It should never be something that's, I don't think, and this is my opinion, but it shouldn't be something that's ever given to an individual, right? It's something that they've clearly demonstrated that that they've earned, right? And you have complete confidence that they're going to be successful because we should never, Absolutely. I also think, you know, we should never put a person in a position where they aren't going to be successful. Um, so anyhow, all, all that to say, right, how the heck do you do that, right? How do you, <laughs> how do you, when you think about this with the lens of DEI, you know, we, in theory, we're giving, you know, everyone in a role the same opportunities to perform, right? Mm -hmm. And the same opportunities to demonstrate that they are um, going to be successful in maybe a promoted role. Um, so I guess, what are your what are your thoughts on that? Hopefully that's a clear enough question. I feel it like it's a, a long, long way to, to get there. But. <laughs> yeah, I, I just uh, want to uh, double click on what you said about meritocracy. Absolutely. I think that's sometimes why DEI gets a bad name because people misunderstand and think that we're hiring, making hiring decisions based on gender, race, or ethnicity. And that's never the case. To your point, we wanna make sure we have a diverse slate um, so that we can make the very best decision, but we wanna make sure that there's diversity in that slate, you know, of qualified candidates. So right. wanna right. make, you know, we're definitely aligned there. Um, I think, you know, number one, it is, 
uh, recruiting, you know, expanding your lens when recruiting. But when we think about developing people and providing opportunities, it's making sure that people have access to mentors and really making sure your middle managers know how to talk about career development. This is such a tough topic for that middle layer of management. They sometimes shy away from career discussions because they think if I have a career dis discussion with someone, there's, then I've set that expectation and I may not be able to fulfill you know, what the person is aspiring to achieve. Um, so number one, making sure that you've got some support for your middle managers and having those career discussions. Um, number two, you know, having some type of a mentorship program. It doesn't have to be something where you're matching people. I've never had good experience where I've been matched with the mentor, but making sure people know how to find a mentor and making sure, again, your middle managers can act as mentors. That's so important. I think back to my time and you know, I got stuck as an engineering supervisor for about 10 years. And it was because I didn't see any other women leading. And, you know, no one was ever challenging me. So I was working for a gentleman who was challenging me, right? He saw more in me. And he said, listen, Cheryl, you know, you're ready for that manager role. We have to start thinking about how we're going to develop you. And I looked at him and I said, well, you know, I thought I was going to have to change who I was as a leader. I thought I was going to have to act like all the men I saw lead. And back in those days, it was a little bit toxic, <laughs> if I'm honest. And I thought I was going to have to yell and scream and pound on the table. And I just said, listen, I don't see anyone who is a role model for me as a leader. And my boss looked at me very confused. He said, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'll try to get you some help. So he set me up with the most senior woman um, in uh, manufacturing engineering. She was an executive VP and I'm standing outside of her office waiting to talk to her. And she was saying, we need to get these engineers home from launch. They haven't been with their families in three months. And I stood out there thinking, wow, if if I was a leader, that's how I would be. Right. I would care about the people. Um, so for me, that was the big aha uh -huh, that shifted everything. Right. I had that discussion with her. She shared a lot of tough love with me. Like, don't let yourself be coddled. If you want to change the game, you've got to play the game suit up. Right. It was it was so uh, transformational for me. So mentors and people that can help talk about career development are so important. And then making sure you've got a solid succession planning process in place. And your people that are doing those talent reviews and are participating in the succession planning, that they can challenge people who may say, I'm fine where I'm at. Maybe you are, but maybe not. Maybe there's more for you. No, that's that's great. That's a very good perspective. Um, all right. Well, Cheryl, I, you know, I definitely uh, I, I could talk to you, I think, for hours, maybe days. Um, this is such a, a deep topic and, and an interesting conversation. I appreciate your insights, um, but I want to be you know, super respectful of your time. Um, but tell me, what, what haven't we talked about that you want to touch on? Anything that uh, I haven't asked you that I should have or anything else that you want to touch on while we, while we have a minute? You know, I, I do want to speak to this topic being very politicized. And we're seeing a lot of headlines right now about companies rolling back their DEI efforts. I would just caution people to let this, this is a long game. Yeah, there's a lot of noise happening right now. But, you know, at the end of the day, this is the right thing to do. This work isn't always done the same way. So, yes, some policies and practices may need to be reexamined and uh, adjusted. But, you know, let's face it, um, when at the end of the day, this is about better representation, making sure we're uh, providing environments and cultures where everyone feels included and that they can succeed. And then we've got policies and practices in place to make sure that we are eliminating bias, discrimination and mistreatment. So it's things like looking at benefits. Um, it is things like making sure we've got equal pay for equal work. Um, it is like we were talking about having that qualified diverse candidate slate. Um, so just let's uh, take a pause here, not get too reactive to what we're seeing in the headlines. You know, the headlines aren't the full story. There's so much more. And as DEI professionals and practitioners, you know, we're we train people um, to not make assumptions and to pause 
and, and not react. Let's respond when we have more data. So I would just caution people to take a beat <laughs> and let's uh, realize that this is this is the long game here we're playing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you don't mind, I'll add to that, too. And just, you know, I, I do get the sense, same as you, right? You see headlines in it. it there, and, and this is any topic. This isn't just DEI. This is any yes. topic, right? A headline yes, yes. is designed to be divisive. That's that's what it's designed for. It's designed to create an emotional reaction and be divisive, um, which is fine, right? It, it gets people to read, and, and that's that's a good thing, right? Having different perspectives on on either side of any topic. Yeah. Um, but when we're talking about this topic specifically, I, I would encourage anybody um, to to also think about it from the business perspective, right? It's not necessarily just about, you know, creating equal opportunity or, you know, um, making sure that, you know, for the sake of, you know, the public good that, that we have this diverse workforce, I would, I would say, you know, think about this from the impact on the business, right? And, and the broader, in, in my opinion, again, like the broader uh, set of people that we have to choose from where we can find the true best person, regardless, again, of, of what they look like, right, or their background or where they grew up, what school they got to go to, to use your example earlier, um, just having a broad set of people to choose from, both when hiring and also when promoting, um, you know, I, I think is where the value comes from. So how do we create this environment where we can bring more people into automotive, again, regardless of, of anything in their background or their genetics or anything else, but how do we bring more people in that want to work in this industry because it is such a great industry? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you think about our demographics in the U.S., they're shifting a bit, right? We're seeing a huge sure. growth in the Hispanic population, um, more women stepping into leadership. But look at the generational change we're seeing. Like I'm Gen X. When I saw millennials come in, I was like, I was so happy because they were not tolerating some of the things my generation tolerated. But Gen Z, like, my goodness, you know, very diverse. They've grown up with diversity all around them um, and they have a voice and a choice. Um, so I, I think it's important to your point. It, it does drive business results. Um, so. I could also talk to you all day, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Cheryl Thompson, I really appreciate you taking time and, and joining us today. Um, you know, keep up the great work and, and hopefully we'll get to catch up again soon. Thank you so much, Greg, for having me. And thank you for the focus on the topic. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Cheryl Thompson as much as I did. Again, she's the CEO and founder of Cadia. Um, and, you know, in this industry full of entrepreneurs, how great is it to see somebody who, who works for 30 years at uh, an industry icon like Ford and then decides to go be an entrepreneur on her own? Uh, you know, hats off to Cheryl. Love what she's doing there. Um, so again, hope you, you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Before we hop off, don't forget, you can watch or listen to all episodes of Connected on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify podcasts. Make sure you hit subscribe so you're notified every other week when new episodes are released. Thanks so much. We'll see you in two weeks.